Welcome to Exhibition. And hello to Mara Dean. Hello, Richard. Thank you for having me on. I'm delighted that, uh, that you're there. Um, and looking forward to having a chat with you. Um, and your exhibition is Hijinks in the Hydrangeas, uh, which is actually being seen simultaneously uh, in two galleries. Um, first of all, it's the inaugural exhibition in the new Nunungula Southern Highlands Regional Gallery in New South Wales, and also in Michael Reed, Sydney. Um, so what, what forms does the exhibition take in these two very different venues? The Nunangula exhibition was the focus point for me when creating this body of work. And um, I made it over the course of about 18 months. So um, through that period, I was quite prolific and I made a really large body of photographic work um, of which uh, a certain number of photographs were curated into the show at Nunangula. And then there was another, I, I could draw another selection of works to show at Michael Reed, Sydney. So um, they're all from the same series, but um, it, they're just a different selection. Uh, and with the exhibition at Nunangula, I've also um, really pushed my practice to include, um, to try and get the the photographs almost um, to extend the experience of viewing them off the wall. So um, I've included, I've worked with sculptures, uh, a large scale installation and um, a moving image work. So there's, there's a number of parts of, um, well, a number of mediums I haven't really used before uh, and they speak to each other. The sculptures speak to the photographs, and there's a yeah, there's a sense of um, yeah, relationships happening in the room. So, can we just make clear before we start talking about the uh, the works themselves that you regard these two exhibitions really very much as as one body of work? Yeah. Um, hijinks in the hydrangeas. You know that that kind of sounds like a lot of fun. But yeah. the subject matter of the exhibition in many ways and the circumstances of creating those works um, often seem a, a darker and more complex series of, of uh, processes. Would that be fair? Absolutely, yeah, that definitely sums it up. Um, and so can you give us a little bit of a sense of that? We've, we've got the, the hijinks in the hydrangeas, but, but what, is, what are those darker and more complex influences? Uh, so I, um, I, I started making the series uh, in uh, March 2020, and that was coming off the back of the bushfires, which led to us evacuating a number of times from our property um, and my mother-in-law losing her home down near Cabago. And um, I suppose that that terrorizing experience um, or terrifying both <laughs> both of those words uh, that really underpins the series because it's just it just sort of sits in the background for me um, emotionally and then uh, and then within a couple of months so so during that process our sense of home went from being a place that was safe to a place that felt incredibly dangerous and and I, I sort of speak about it as though you know what what that took from us was our sense of home and um which was a you know which was a very unsettling feeling and uh but then within a couple of months when COVID came because I'm out on six acres it became um suddenly it tipped upside down and became this you know this retreat and this place where I could just you know, spend time in the landscape. And uh, we were lucky enough to have that sense of space around us. So it was a really um, topsy-turvy experience because home then became this, you know, this place of replenishment again. And, and those two very real, very scary experiences feed into the sense of anxiety that is in that series. And in the beginning, I was I had a working title of In, in Isolation. But um, 
when I um when I started, I I, I began photograph. I didn't know I couldn't rely on photographing anyone else. So um, with COVID and with the lockdown, so I decided to use myself as my model and I, as as a kind of almost as a kind of therapy each afternoon I'd head out with my camera and my lights and and myself <laughs> and I'd just head out onto our block and see what I could make and just the act of physically kind of pushing myself into the landscape and trying to find elements that I could interact with that was a really grounding experience uh and and then the I, I I still get a real sense of elation when I create photographs that I that I'm happy with. So that whole process was quite enjoyable, and and I was able to sort of while I was in the shoot, as I was dashing between the camera and the position I wanted to be in, and just turning upside down and putting myself in all these physical kind of situations, I could kind of look at myself from the outside, and I, I found that quite amusing. And I thought if anyone else could see me, I looked absolutely crazy. You mentioned uh, choosing yourself, in fact, not really having that much choice about using yourself as your model because of the restrictions of COVID lockdown. Um, and, and that in many ways is a very different situation to the group images or, or the groups of people uh, whom you've captured photographically previously. Um, but it's, it's interesting that you sometimes do turn yourself almost into a group. Uh, in, that, yes. uh, in that there are often multiple versions of yourself in images. How different did it feel creating a group rather than just simply working with a group? It's interesting because I quite often when I'm working, it's like when I'm photographing, it's quite an intuitive process. So uh, when there's a whole group of people, I can sort of respond to what's happening in front of me and and kind of work out the balance and how that will all come together. But when I was using my own figure, I had to kind of try and allow a bit of freedom in where I might end up in front of the lens, but then also try and envision how that, you know, that gesture that I'm making might interact with another gesture that, um, that I place myself in elsewhere in the frame. And so uh, I guess that I had to kind of have a little bit of an, an idea of narrative when I was doing that. So there's one work called Escapade and I have myself as four figures kind of tumbling down a hill. And, um, and so that involved just kind of envisioning where, you know, what the parameters of that would be and how that action might play out. In a way, I, I sort of, in a lot of the photographs, I make myself almost not unrecognisable, but I'm not necessarily looking to camera so that it kind of allows the viewer to imagine that those people might, in some of the photographs, might be two different people or three different people. And, and I'm just using my body as a figure um, rather than as me. There does seem to be a, a sense with some of the works that you are incredibly close to, to nature, almost becoming a part of it. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of a work like uh, Close to the Earth. Um, I wrap my face in her cloak of petals and breathe deeply. You almost look as though you're becoming, or you in, are indeed a part of that that piece of of vegetation, that growing and blossoming form. Um, you know, and similarly with fleeting, um, so many blossoms and the bodies underneath them. It's hard to tell which is what. Well, I, I guess that comes down to the the message I'm trying to get through, which is. Um, you know the the truth that we are part of nature, and I think there's a lot of uh, aspects of our lives that uh, distract from that truth. And uh, for this series, I'm really I really wanted to, as you say, immerse myself in the environment and and just really try and create that visual sort of symbolism that that we are entwined we are we are part of something that is you know we're we're in an ecosystem we are you know we're all dependent on air and water and all of the life cycles of the creatures mm -hmm. around us so yeah I'm just really trying to to make a visual connection to that truth there are some images, though, that do seem to be uh, very particular moments and 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 very carefully captured and and planned, almost ritualized moments. Um, I'm thinking of a, a work like Dawn Dance, um, 
or the uh, extraordinarily powerful sense of perhaps ancient magic that is part of um, a clap of thunder rising from deep inside my soul. Can you give us a sense of your, your feeling and intent with those two works? Um, yeah, I, I can absolutely see what you're saying with Dawn Dance. There is a, a sense of kind of um, conjuring with dance. <laughs> that work was taken on a, it must have been minus zero morning. <laughs> and I'd, I'd driven up to the Highlands with, with my husband, Johnny, and uh, in the hope for fog, which there was there was none. <laughs> and so I, I, I guess in a way, um, the way I moved through the landscape that morning was, yeah, it was. It did have a ritualistic kind of feeling to it. Um, some of which was me really trying to get as little of myself in the water as possible because it was so cold. <laughs> I often kind of find myself uh, finding these sort of animal postures that um, that I'm referring to that that have an Art Deco kind of feeling to them um, or you know, Norman Lindsay or Sydney Long, that there's sort of echoes of these, these mm. painters that come through in, um, in the way that I've used my figure. In that other work we referred to, uh, A Clap of Thunder Rising, uh, it seems as though there is, though, a, a really ancient power, ancient magic. It's as though suddenly this energy has been released explosively into the air. Uh, mm. how, how much, again, of that is something that you that you plan to make, or do you build on the, the artefact of the moment? That is probably one of my proudest images. Uh, that photograph, uh, it sort of represents a few things to me. Um, I'm very proud that I made that completely on my own, with my own body, in the landscape, without any assistance and just made it sort of, for me, it was a bit of a conjuring. Um, it was a bit of sort of taking back some power. And uh, as you'll see, as you know, in the exhibition, there's a, I've used this powder in a way that is, is visually um, referencing COVID and the bushfires and all the smoke from the bushfires. And, and for me, this photograph, was sort of almost like harnessing those elements and sort of reclaiming my space or my, um, yeah, something really important inside of myself. It's sort of taken everything I've learnt as an artist and photographer to make that image. It, it you know it was all of my it was my skills as a photographer and then um, my learning how to work with that powder as a visual element and and the landscape and the light and there were just so many elements in that photograph that were challenging uh, and for me it's just a very uh, it's sort of like I've pulled something out from inside of myself and just thrust it like you say like a sort of like it, those images of the gods throwing around mm. thunder and lightning and there's, there's something of, of that uh, reference in there. You mentioned these, these elements of powder, of a of sort of smoke in the air, these miasmic elements that reference uh, either the, the COVID microbes or, or bushfire uh, elements of the past. Um, with works uh, like Shake It Off or hanging in there we can see that they're just kind of part of your environment um, but with smoke signals uh, it is a, a work which almost looks as though you're in the midst of a combat zone as though it's you know part of a world that you're very actively inhabiting can you tell us a little more about the use of that um, smoky material as a as a visual element um, yeah, it, it's funny you say that about the combat zone because I really there was a point where I fled our property with with our son and um, and it to me it felt like a combat zone. We were we the, the, there was smoke everywhere. We were driving out as we were driving down the highway just down down the way here. 
there was, um, I could see our friend's property on fire and there, were hel there was a helicopter dropping water there. And as we drove further past Berry, there was helicopters and it was just, it felt, it felt like, I mean, I haven't been in a combat zone, so obviously not like a war zone, but there was a sense of everything feeling very out of control. And, um, and so that photograph, uh, that photograph really does tap into that feeling. And um, also just sort of this idea, like I've called it, um, when, I'm, when I'm using the word smoke signals in the title, I'm sort of talking about how, you know, how redundant a smoke signal is, you know, it's supposed to be what you send up when you're in trouble and just how redundant that is in, in the conditions we're experiencing with climate change, it's just where, you know, it's all just gone, yeah, out of control. Those elements of, of the bushfire smoke or the, the COVID in the air or the climate change, all of these things that, that in many ways we, we feel somewhat under attack from, uh, seem to be very much a part of the video work dysrhythmia, uh, which is projected very large on a wall at Nonangula, um, but also uh, on a, a screen at Michael Reed in Sydney. Um, and that was made uh, with the assistance of your partner, uh, filmmaker Johnny Leahy. Um, but it also seems something where you are the recipient of, you know, of all the kind of the long suffering, almost stoic recipient of, of all of this uh, incoming material. Um, and yet often that process is one where in the Indian festival of Holi, uh, it's a very celebratory thing. But here it seems almost as though you're, you're under attack. Can you, can you tell us a little about what you imagined this video to, to evoke for an audience? This work took a, a long time to conceive, actually. It was the last work I made for the whole exhibition. Um, and I'd really, I'd really spend a long time trying to work out how to express um, what I was trying to say. And it was a bit of a process um, that goes into some fairly personal sort of experiences I had over the last 18 months. And um, the title itself comes from, um, I, I developed, uh, over that summer with the bushfires, I developed this extra heartbeat um, I ended up having to have these tests and it was a, essentially like with the anxiety of it, I developed this heartbeat that I could feel, which is a very strange feeling. And um, with, um, you know, with the smoke and with COVID, suddenly I developed this awareness of my breath and, and of what I was breathing in and, and what, if I smelt something, was that going into my lungs and all of this sort of claustrophobic sort of feelings and suffocating feelings around what was actually entering my lungs. But the powder itself and the fact that someone could hold it and throw it, it was very easy to control whilst being out of control. And so, as you say, in the video work, um, I'm sort of smashed by it over and over again. And, and there's a sense of, you know, it sort of dies away and then it comes back. And, um, and then I'm just sort of copying it and just stealing myself again. And, you know, as, we, as we've all done over this period. So it became a really great device for me to, to express what I ultimately wanted to in, the, in that work. You mentioned earlier with the exhibition at Nunungula, uh, how you wanted to perhaps expand the experience of, a, of, of the audience or a viewer um, into more than just a, a two-dimensional one. Tell us about the type and, and the process of creating the sculptures, the sculptural elements for that exhibition. Um, that was a quite an intuitive process. Uh, I, I knew that I, in the same way I'd use my body for the photographs, I wanted to use my reference my body in the sculptures. And so um, I um, worked with Claire Tennant to um, cast my limbs and uh, and I really wanted to sort of highlight those intersections of where intersections of where my hands would um, would kind of come into contact with with a branch or these these points of contact and um, and sort of the 
I guess in a way, you know, when I'm throwing myself through the landscape, the trees became a real sense of support and um, a physical support. But also, you know, you pick up a stick and it become, can become a weapon. So I liked that kind of um, those two ways of, of seeing that, um, you know, that, that part of nature, you know, as a support, but also as a way of protecting yourself. With uh, there's something in the air, these flying shears, there seems a pretty interesting balance between something which is to start with almost humorous looking, and then you realize actually that they're airborne cutting machines. Yes. Um, again, how did you find the right sort of balance for that? And, and, and how did you imagine how it was going to end up feeling? Well, I'd, I'd made a work um, which is in the exhibition, which is called Self Care, which um, which references a couple of things. Um, I, I had um, Johnny, my husband, give me a, um, a home sort of lockdown haircut and uh, where I had half of my head shaved. And, and then I went into, and I was looking at the hedges in the Southern Highlands and just sort of thought it was a funny kind of comparison to, to make. And also sort of this idea, you know, my imagination went wild and this idea of, you know, when what happened, when there's no one to tend the hedges or who does make the hedges do you ever see that that person do, you know are they doing it themselves so I sort of was referencing that home haircut idea but when I'd taken those photographs I saw, I was looking at the shears um, that I had coming out of the out of the hedge and and they suddenly looked I could see they sort of looked like they were flying like they almost looked like fairies or little <laughs> you know, little bugs flying around and I thought wow what a great way of um because they're quite a a heavy object quite a you know a, a savage object this idea that it could look like it had a sense of flight and but the the shears up in the air are meant to represent um this you know this savage kind of deadly thing we have coursing through the air and it's it's very much a visualization of, of, of covid for me i find installations quite exciting in that you, it just builds so much more of what I'm trying to into the photographic experience. Um, and yeah, I find that a really interesting area to work in. It's just, you need a bit of support here and there for someone to say, here's a space. And that's what Nun and Gula did. So I had that opportunity again to make, to make a big work. Well, it's been fascinating to be able to share the, the creative elements of your practice and the way in which they've come to fruition in this single body of work, but spread across two extraordinary exhibiting spaces. So Tamara Dean, thanks very much for sharing the exhibition with us. Thanks, Richard.